Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist, and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. New on Curiosity Stream, how do you connect a 16th century potato to limitless energy production? Could Napoleon's toothpick have a direct link to a machine that predicts the future? And how can a 1700s conch shell chart a course to humans connecting their brains to the internet? James Burke's visionary series, Connections, returns for a new generation. Experience all new Connections with monthly annual and bundled plans. Find the one that works for you at CuriosityStream.com. Stove Leg Media, igniting conversation. Hey there, thinkers. Happy spooky season. It's me, your girl, your host, Elena Grace. And you're listening to our first Halloween special on I've Been Thinking. I am so beyond thrilled to bring this episode to you all because it is never been done before, groundbreaking, stunning, evocative, incredible, all of the dramatic adjectives that you can think of, this is it. It is also educational, it is um, thoughtful and poignant and a bit inspirational as well. I have procured for you, my thinkers, a very special interview. Again, something that has never been done on a podcast before. I can quite confidently say that this has never been done. This is, you are here to listen to an interview with a ghost. I have very carefully summoned the ghost of Constantine Samuel Rafinisk to come to you today to give you insights on his life and his afterlife. And I am so thrilled to share this with you. He is such a fun conversationalist and he is a brilliant, still a brilliant uh, speaker and thinker. So he fits right in with us, huh? Now, if you did not go to Transylvania University, where I attended and where Constantine was a professor for a few years, um, I'll give you a little background on him, okay? And we go more into this in the episode, in the interview, but... Raffinesk was a botanist. He was just an incredible researcher, a traveler, an explorer. He was a man of the world. He worked very hard, and he has established an incredible legacy for himself in the world of science. However, he was wholly unappreciated in his time, as most of us are, and his works are only in recent years really being acknowledged for how accurate some of them were and how important some of his contributions were. At the time, he was not particularly friendly. Um, you'll hear in the episode, he is, he's rather friendly now. Um, so, you know, that's wonderful. The afterlife has given him some time to work on that. Uh, no. I, I joke, I joke, he was wonderful. And he is just, he provides us with some really, really wonderful insights. He really does. So without further ado, I wish you all a happy mid-October. And here's Constantine. Oh, yes.
Yes, my name is Konstantin Semyon Rafinisk. I am a ghost, having died in uh, 1840. Uh, Mademoiselle Elena has invited me here today to talk about my life and uh, the afterlife and uh, uh, anything else. Uh, I'm sure something will come up. Yeah? Perfect. Hi, Raf. How are you? Do not, please, no. Don't, oh, do okay. not call me rough. Oh, no, okay. No. You're right. You're right. Um, well, <laughs> Constantine, I am just so thrilled that you agreed to come on and talk with me today. Um, you know, I went to Transylvania University and I have heard your story and have admired your work for years and years. I think you're just so fascinating and so brilliant. And I really feel connected to you in some ways. And um, so, Thank you for being here. Of course, uh, it is uh, my pleasure to be here with you on uh, the, the podcast. Um, not too familiar with this uh, technology, but uh, the world is continuing to grow in many different ways. And uh, I suppose this is just another form of communication. It works okay. Indeed it is. It's rather like like letters that everyone can read. Well, like a book, I suppose. Indeed, but uh, far far less romantic. Uh, the, le uh, writing letters and uh, keeping things much more personal through ink and paper is always my preferred way of communication. But uh, we will make do. We will make do. You're so right about that. I love a romantic. So, Constantine, um, can you tell us a little bit about your early life? Like I always ask my guests you know, what their journey was, what led them to this point. So let's go back to the beginning and talk about, you know, when you were a young man. I was born in uh, Constantine, or uh, excuse me, uh, Constantine, Constantinople, which uh, is uh, perfect for my name, I suppose. Um, and that is uh, modern day uh, Istanbul, actually, um, which is in uh, Turkey in that area. So that is where I was born. But uh, as my accent probably you can tell, I was raised in France, uh, mostly self educated, never went to uni. I, I like to think that uh, the world around me was my. That was, that was my school, and from there I was able to collect plants by the age of 12 and learn from those and take notes and figure things out. And then uh, I taught myself Greek and, and Latin by 14, and then uh, I came over to the uh, United States uh, when I was just a boy. I was uh, only 19 years old and made some friends, made some enemies, but uh, overall it was a, a great adventure for a, a young man to take. That is incredible that's an incredible story um you know having that experience of being first of all being born in the ottoman empire that feels wild because today that feels so far back in time um not to call you old or anything um but that just feels so far disconnected from where we are today even though i know that it really isn't and it was only disbanded if you will, uh, quite recently in the larger scale of things. But it's just so interesting. And I think it's amazing that you were so accomplished, but so heavily self-taught. And the fact that you never even attended university is amazing. Yeah, I, I never thought that uh, that the professors and uh, the teachers, that they necessarily were looking out for my best interest. I look out for my best interest always. And I felt like I could push myself further if I wanted to learn about something specific. I could focus on it a bit more. And I didn't have to sit necessarily in the structure of the school. Um, but... I think that that's not for everyone. I know that there are plenty of people who need that structure to continue to grow and progress. I just was not one of those people. I I love that. I think that's really that that really hammers home my very strong belief that I've come to um, over the past probably decade that college is or university, whatever you want to call it, is not as necessary as we once thought and were taught. Um, and it's definitely not necessary for everybody. I think that's such an important observation and that you can be so, so educated, even with that. So educated and um, successful without that higher education, quote unquote. I just think that's really interesting. You're a perfect example. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. So 
I wanted to say, I, d- I didn't realize you had been in the United States for so long. I didn't realize you came when you were 19 years old. Yes, but I uh, I did not actually stay in the United States for as long as, uh, well, not for the rest of my life. So I actually moved back th- to uh, Europe and lived in uh, Italy and Sicily for uh, about a um, about, about a decade or so. Um, I had some family problems that prompted a move back to the U.S. And um, I, I just did a, a lot of really, really great work, though, in Italy. It was just legacy building. And upon my move back to um, the, uh, at, uh, um, the the states, uh, pardon, um, my ship actually wrecked off the coast, and I lost everything. I lost my my studies, all of my notes, all of my specimens, um, everything, just into the uh, Atlantic, and it crushed me. It I, I think about it still all the all the time. Um, it, it does not leave me. I know I haunt certain things, but uh, that haunts me. Oh wow, that is the, oh, what a tragedy! I am so sorry that that happened to you. I can't imagine all of that work. I mean, at that point, it's you know your life's work almost just being washed away. How poignant, um, yeah. though that 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 observation of that haunts you still. And maybe it's um, karma. Um, I'm not uh, sure how you say, but um, the, the, the afterlife gives you a, a lot of time to think and to uh, kind of and think about what you've lost and why that may be the case. Maybe it's because of something I've done before. Maybe it's uh, out of my hands. Um, even in the afterlife, there's still many uh, questions that are not answered yet for me. Oh wow, that yeah. I guess you're right about that. Um, so speaking of that, well, you know what? We'll we'll get to the afterlife in a minute. I want to ask you this uh, next. What brought you to Transylvania? Because that's Transylvania is what brought me to you, right? Uh, yes, I was uh, traveling in Kentucky, and uh, which you, uh, Lena, you are obviously uh, with your accent, you are very familiar <laughs> with uh, with am. Kentucky. Uh, and there, I, uh, I was traveling through, and I met uh, Jean James uh, Autobahn, and that guy yeah, uh, put on the worst. He was so annoying and so rude, and he was just a, a prankster and a <laughs> bastard, whatever you want to call him. He was a um, a thorn thorn in my side, yeah, as you say. Um, but I spent some time with him, and he just would never leave me alone. You know, I have a friend like that, and um, she, Lord, she drives me crazy. But if it makes you feel any better, everything I've read of Audubon's says that he enjoyed your friendship very much. So there is that. Um, do you guys ever see each other on campus? I know that he has some some massive pieces in the special collections in Transy's library. So I was wondering if he's ever around. Uh, yes, uh, we do see each other from time to time as we are passing through. Um, th- years ago, there were some uh, some young um, garçons, uh, some um, some boys that were uh, trying to take some of his books. And I, I would lie, yeah. I was kind of watching from the sidelines and kind of rooting <laughs> them on, you know, just kind of hoping it's like a friend of me kind of thing. Uh, but uh, ultimately, no, no, they didn't take him. And, and he still uh, is in that area. I, I uh, Though personally, I know that everyone thinks that I'm in that uh, on campus at uh, Transylvania University in Lexington. But uh, I'm not there as much as one may think, I guess. I kind of had a feeling that was the case. Um, I think we're going to come back to that here in a few moments. So uh, back back to the the question a little bit. So did Audubon send you to Transy or? Uh, no, no, I guess um, I'll, I'll let you decide. Uh, I, I guess so. he had some <laughs> other friends. Uh, they had uh, connections there, and they secured me a professorship. So in that regard, yes, I was in the area. I was passing through, and they helped me out. Um, it, it really was, though, a wonderful time <laughs> at uh, Trend Z. I, I was able to speak French. Uh, I taught French. I uh, spoke and uh, was able to teach Latin, and I tried to uh, start a um, uh, the jardin uh, b- b- botanical garden, uh, as you say, and I got no support from uh, the uh, upper management uh, or leaders on campus. So 
that did not go so well, uh, but it was an effort that I would do again and again and again, over and over, as long as my uh, my ghost lives on. <laughs> that That is awful that they didn't support you starting a botanical garden. I mean, I would have absolutely adored that when I was on campus. Uh, I was born in uh, maybe the wrong era. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I now today maybe things would be much different, uh, and the botanical garden would be uh, brought in with open arms, but uh, not not so much back then. That's fair. I have wondered uh, a few times if perhaps I was born in the wrong era as well. I'm still not sure. Um, but is that back to is that lack of support what caused you to leave Transylvania? Just the the administration kind of not allowing you to spread your wings as far as you'd like because i know the rumors that i've heard rumors uh, what what uh what what have you heard uh, well yeah, you know of course at at transylvania we were always taught uh how beyond brilliant you were and your story is just such a big part of the campus story and your le- Mont, of course yes. yeah of course so your legacy is outstanding um you know, but we we did often hear that you had an affair with the president's wife, and he kicked you off campus. And some people even say he tried to have you killed. An assassination is what you mean. That is the bottom line. I I we I, I quarreled with uh, my colleagues there at Transylvania, and they were struggling. As I said, they were living in uh, the shadow of my genius. And I was discovering new species and publishing new scientific names by uh, hundreds. Uh, And I was discovering the most minute differences between species and theorizing about evolution before that. uh, What's the man that married his cousin? Uh, Darwin. Darwin. Uh, (laughs) Whenever he was talking about this, I had already covered all of that uh, several years before. And I was trying to preserve uh, things like native burial mounds in Kentucky and deciphering Mayan languages. I was doing it. I was really pushing the limits of education. For what? For what? I mean, you're absolutely right, Raph. You were doing incredible work. Again? Don't call me Raph. Uh, you're right. You're right. Um, so I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think anybody today denies your absolute star power. You were... A power, at least nobody today who has a, a real understanding of the the work that you did. You were an absolute powerhouse of discovery. But what I really want to know, and um, ultimately what the listeners want to know too, are you going to confirm or deny the affair? Like once and for all, let's get it out in the open. You're here. Let let's get it. In the uh, in, in the afterlife, daytime television is still a thing, unfortunately, and oh. I have seen this uh, Mori Povich show uh, all the time. Is that what this is? Is this like a secret Mori Povich show? <laughs> all I will say, all I will say, is that uh, the the president, um, nice guy, I guess, he fired me because of jealousy. Let's just keep it there. Yeah, yeah, no, no need to get into all the details. Uh, you know, it's. Um, it wasn't French, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there. You, you know what? That's fair. That's absolutely fair for legal reasons, as I like to say. We'll leave it there. Um, no, this is not a secret Maury show, but you know, every once in a while, we've got to get a little, get a little gossip in there. I guess you it's can part never of your be journey. Sure, so, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so, for after Transylvania, after you were chased off campus. Um, where did we go next? So once I was chased out of Kentucky, I figured that um, the place where very forward thinkers are centered, where the uh, maybe birthplace of America really was, um, was Philadelphia. So I moved northeast and I settled in there for uh, a little while. Oh, beautiful. You're so right. How poetic. The founding place of the United States, um, essentially, the uh, birthplace of knowledge. That's that's really beautiful. And so you were fun employed for a little while, like while you were there, right? Did you say unemployed or what was oh, that? Fun employed. That's what I call. Fun, fun employed? Yeah. 
What's wrong with you? It's, uh, being unemployed is just uh, part of being French. You, you, you just, you know, what, what is work? You know, we don't need to work. Uh, all unemployment is fun employment, I suppose. But you don't have to shorten it like that. You can say unemployment and uh, it's just understood. You're being repetitive by saying it's fun employment. What's yeah. wrong? With, uh, Elena, you, um, I, I do appreciate you bringing me on here, but come on, let's keep up. That's, yeah, that's fair. My boyfriend thinks it's stupid too. Um, so <laughs> maybe I should have been born French. Um, so while you were there, you were, you were researching or were, what were you doing while you were there? <laughs> I did. I moved there to focus on my research. I was not leaving or fleeing any angry husband or jealous husband or anything like that of any potential lover that I may have had in the past. But uh, I continued lecturing and publishing my work. So not totally unemployed. I was just uh, living life by my own means. And uh, then it was there in the year 1840 that I died of cancer. Unfortunately, my uh, reign had come to an end and my prowess on this earth had vanished at least for the time being but i am very happy to see that my legacy has lived on and it gives me a chance to talk to you with a little bit of uh what's the word uh relevance in today's society and um i, I yeah that's uh, that's where my story i suppose ends well i'll say this really quick um your letters to the president's wife were were, were beautiful okay moving on from that um so Kid, I don't think that your story really ended there, though, because once again, obviously, you're still relevant. Um, and I think that anybody with a good understanding of basically what uh, what contributes to science today, uh, biology especially, can see that you are still very relevant. And um, yeah, anyway, you your your story did not end there, and uh, clearly because you're still around. Uh, so can you tell us about your your burial a bit in Philadelphia? Because that really contributed to your uh, lasting connection with Transylvania University. Yeah, maybe it is uh, just American arrogance to just assume that uh, my story continues to go on after I am dead. But you are right. I, I have had a... A number of, um, of of nice moments in the afterlife, and it is good that we can still have these chats. But um, back to what you were saying, I was buried in uh, Ronald uh, uh, the Ars um, Ronaldson Cemetery, uh, and it was uh, a kind of space where uh, you'd be buried uh, one on top of another on top of another to save space. Um, it was economical, really. I mean, we're not doing anything under the ground, so uh, it made sense to me. But um, from there, um, I, I think you know the story you alluded to. Um, that's why I'm here, after all. Uh, a good 80 years later, what was thought to be my body was excavated and moved back to Transylvania University. So the Ivy League idiots got the wrong body. That's the problem. They exhumed the wrong body. They grabbed a girl's bones and put her in a tomb with my name. So uh, totally, totally uh, screwed the pooch. Is that uh, screwed the pooch? Screwed the pig? What's the yeah, term? Screwed the pooch. That is actually one of my father's favorite sayings. So do we do we give these guys any credit for trying at all? I mean, they they were they were trying to kind of right some wrongs. You would think with their uh, Ivy League uh, pieces of paper, the diplomas, they are just uh, incredible pompousness of themselves. They would be able to read the damn map. They would be able to notice uh, the obvious differences between a woman's bones and my bones. Um, I, I mean, c come on, I am s I, maybe not the most uh, strapping individual, but I feel like I, you know, my, my females were, were, they were big, they, they were strong, they were, uh, maybe not, maybe that was false, but either way, I truly feel like these Ivy League experts were the fools at the end of the day. I guess that's fair. Uh, yeah, they really... You're right. They really should have kind of known what they were looking for, right? Um, so ultimately, they they snagged, they exhumed what was thought to be your body, and they brought it back to campus to give, quote, 
honor to whom honor is overdue, which is what they inscribed on the um, on the top of your tomb, which I think is a really sweet sentiment, you know, and they buried you in buried, you know, quote unquote, you're above ground. Uh, well, the tomb is above ground uh, in this really cool little space on campus. I've actually been in there. Um, it's really neat. It's really cold in there, of course. I mean, it's anyway. Um, and, you know, the tomb is dedicated to you and, you know, whatever. But ultimately, we find out that the bones in there are more than likely, like 99%, um, a young lady named Miss Mary Passamore. And uh, really sad that they screwed up that bad. Have, have you met her, by the way? Uh, yes, um, actually, I feel like I have seen you potentially uh, in the uh, in in that area before. Now, granted, it's no uh, Père Lachaise, it's no uh, Grand Cemetery, but it, it is a nice gesture, at least, to have something even with the wrong bones in it, named and uh, intended for uh, myself. So, uh, yes, I have met uh, Mademoiselle Marie before. She's uh, very sweet. Um, but uh, she, she did not, uh, I, I would say at least, she did not deserve to have her body wrongly um, interred incorrectly, I suppose. But um, to be fair, I am glad for her that uh, she's all in one piece, uh, safely in that nice, cool tomb. And um, other bodies lay with us. And uh, what was then named the Philadelphia Cemetery, uh, all of those other bodies uh, there, they they did not all get relocated when the gravesite was moved. There are plenty of pieces of bones and uh, former people that are still laying beneath what's now like a um, what's it called, like a play park, uh, a play park for children, I suppose. Oh shit, Raph, that's dark. I'm I'm really sorry that you weren't treated with the decency that you deserve. Um, I hate when that happens, when they just kind of forget, quote unquote, to, uh, to, to move all of those literal human beings. Now, can I ask, does that kind of treatment lead to restlessness in the afterlife? Uh, now, by, um, by oath, I am not actually an, uh, entitled to give too much information about uh, the afterlife, but um, I, I have come to discover that it is not as I necessarily expected. Um, again, I won't say much, but uh, we, we have to keep uh, a little bit of wonder in all of those that are still living. But um, I will say that in my uh it was my nature on earth to be a bit restless and it remains in my nature still even beyond death to be a bit restless i suppose that is a really poetic observation constantine um sorry i called you raf again earlier i have one more question for you really quick and uh, this is a big one okay okay yeah uh that's that's that's, that's fine do you actually impose a curse on Transylvania's campus every seven years? I know a lot of people who want to know that far more than any other gossip from your lifetime. So, on uh, again, just like daytime television, we also have uh, the podcast uh, app, and <laughs> I have been able to listen to uh, podcasts about me before. Not too many. I've listened to this uh, this I've been thinking show that you host. Um, uh, for better or worse, Ooh, I guess. Honored. And uh, if I can steal one of your lines from you, or at least borrow, for legal reasons, I cannot disclose whether or not I come back to haunt Transylvania every seven years or, or so. But um, I have been on campus. I will tell you, uh, during some of the more wild events that have taken place, events that don't happen on your uh, normal college campus, that's true. We had a machete attack one time. Were you around for that? Unfortunately, yes. I uh, I, I cannot deny. I was in uh, the vicinity, uh, not during the attack necessarily, but I was there very shortly after. And uh, um, vigorous. Uh, mm. d disgusting, I suppose. Yeah. it was, And, I mean, you've already admitted that you were rooting on the... Uh, the boys who were trying to... Uh... Only slightly, only slightly. I couldn't totally <laughs> wish for the, uh, the demise of uh, Audubon, but uh, it was it was a 
a useful folly um, that uh, I think gives a lot of people a lot of uh, hopefully laughs at uh, the end of the day. I, I think so too. One of my favorite professors, it was one of my favorite things to get him to tell the story of the want to be heist. Uh, how, how fun to know that you were around and you were chuckling as well alongside of it. They were the, uh, I mentioned American arrogance, and those <laughs> four boys, they are the, uh, the epitome of American arrogance. The and, epitome. Uh, yeah. You're exactly right about that. Well, sir, that, that really just, um, that says it all for me that, <laughs> that you have agreed that you're around uh, for those two events. I'm going to take that and... Um, that's just got, yeah, that does it for me. So I, I want to thank you, Constantine Raffinesque, for your time today. Uh, while you and uh, so many other Americans butcher my, uh, my last name, uh, Raffinesque. <laughs> Raffinesque. Uh, Raffinesque. They, uh, that's, that's okay. I understand. I do appreciate you uh, having me on your show and uh, for you and all of uh, the other students at Transylvania University who have been there, who are going to go there. Uh, let's just say I uh, I may be seeing you very, very soon. For today's episode was written by myself, Elena Grace Campbell, our voice actor, aka vassal for a disembodied ghost, to revisit our plane of existence. Playing Constantine Rafanisk is none other than Nate Metz of Stoveleg Media Productions and Mysteries of the Ohio Valley. And our subject matter is a real life character. Constantine Rafinisk. He was a brilliant scientist and somebody whose legacy has touched my life in many ways. I thank Constantine for allowing us to do this episode about him. All source material can be found in the show notes of this episode on www.ivebeenthinkingpod.com forward slash blog and any and all all statements made regarding Constantine Rafinisk's life should be taken with a grain of salt. Please refer to these references and your own research to establish your own understanding of who this man really was. Though this episode does do its best to stick to the facts and to present him in a positive light only. Thank you for listening to I've Been Thinking. Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. 